Ava Gross graduated from the Middlebury Institute, formerly the Monterey Institute of International Studies, in 2010 with a degree in Translation and Localization Management, that's TLM, and became the first ever recipient of the Miss Young Alumni Achievement Award from the TLM department in 2016. And for the last 12 years, Ava has been working in multiple roles in localization and product management, creating and localizing products customers love worldwide. She previously worked at Language Automation, Apple, Bold, and Stripe. In fact, she founded the localization programs at Bold and Stripe. And it's not an understatement to say that localization is now a core part of these companies' go-to-market strategy. And in the case of Stripe, the culture among developers has shifted from English-centric to creating native feeling experiences for Stripe merchants and customers worldwide. Ava is currently consulting startups on how to create and scale localization programs from scratch. And we are so grateful to have her join us today to talk about building a localization team from the ground up, product localization, and starting a career in localization. So please help me welcome Ava Gross. We're joined here today with uh, Ava Gross. Thank you so much for coming on. Thanks for having me. All right, so it's me, uh, Lin Nguyen, and Ji Hong Zhou for Look Ready. And today we'll be talking about um, how to build a localization team from the ground up with Ava. So Ava, um, what got you into localization and you know what keeps you here? Tell me a bit about yourself. Yeah, absolutely. It's kind of a funny story because most kids don't want to become what their parents are. And both my parents were translators. My dad was also an interpreter. So it's quite funny, actually. I would never intended to do this. The story went a little bit like, you know, I was, um, I studied political science, international relations for my undergrad. I also was doing some translation work freelance on the site for my mom's translation office. She runs the translation office in Germany. And so eventually I really liked the flexibility of translation. I loved languages in Germany. We learn a lot of languages. We start our first foreign language in fifth grade, second and seventh grade, third and ninth grade. And I've always loved it. And so um, I was on pros.com, which is a popular freelance translation website. And I saw a banner ad. You guys know, like the banner ads on top for Miss. And I was like, oh, what is this? And at the time, it was the Monterey Institute of International Studies still was called it back then, right? And so I was like, let me look into this. A master's degree in translation. That sounds cool. So um, I researched the school. I applied to the school. I started actually as TNI. Um, I had no idea what localization was at all when I start, came to Miss. Um, and then I had one life-changing moment, um, and it happened through my favorite mentor and professor. You guys had him on the show. His name is John Ritzdorf. He had taught us in CAT 1, and in CAT 1, he said, dear translation students, please be very nice to your localization colleagues, because they're going to be the ones giving you work. It's like, okay, <laughs> I want to be on that side of the coin. <laughs> so, you know, that's kind of that that's the truth that was my click moment like it clicked for me um at the same time i really prefer localization because i'm pretty social and i like to work you know i'm i like technical things as well so i i loved how localization kind of combined language technology program management so i really immediately was just like wow let me do more of this this is really cool so that's that's how i first got into localization um yeah Wow. And you've been in the industry for about 20, no, no, 12 years now. That's a long time. What has happened in that span? Oh, what have I done in that span? Okay. So when I first graduated Miss, I, I thought I wanted to, well, I wanted to start my own company and I did start my own company at first. And what I did is I um, had several clients, some were actually referred to me by our career a counselor at Miss at the time, Jeff Wood. He was the career counselor for like 30 years um, back in the day before Winnie. And so I had a few clients and started to build my business. Uh, we did wine marketing translations, we had real estate translations, um, mostly not actually for German at all. It was actually for traditional and simplified Chinese, for a lot of them Spanish and Brazilian Portuguese. So I hired some Miss students as well and built that up. And so it was. Um, it was great, except I realized starting my own business right out of school was pretty good, but I still wanted to learn more from other people in an office environment. So um, 
I ended up applying to Apple, Google, and Pinterest at the time. And then I got a job at Apple. So that was really exciting. I was a contract at Apple via Moravia. And I was at Apple for about nine months, um, commuting from San Francisco to Cupertino every day. It got very tiring, but I had a great time. I learned a lot at Apple, but it was, you know, I, I really was looking for something a little bit closer to home and also something where I would have a little bit more, um, I guess um, I, I could kind of bring my own creativity and also kind of start something from scratch. And so, um, and this is something I would tell every my students, it's all about networking. So um, I had mentioned how I had applied to Eventbrite. I think I said Eventbrite. Yeah, it was Apple, Google, and Eventbrite. Um, and so I was in the final round for Eventbrite, and I lost the role to someone who had 10 more years experience, of course, makes total sense. And one day I just wrote him on LinkedIn. Um, I sent him a LinkedIn message and said, hey, Patrick, his name is Patrick McLaughlin. He taught at Miss before as well. And I said, hey, Patrick, how's my dream job? <laughs> he had never met me. He knew nothing about me, right? And so, but he loved it. He was so funny. He said, hey, let me call you. So, you know, we back then it was Skype. It wasn't Zoom yet, right? So we hacked on Skype. And so we were talking and, he's, and we had a nice chat. And he said, well, it looks like you're looking, you know, working at a startup. You'd like to work at a startup and hopefully in the city in San Francisco. Um, I'll keep you in mind if something comes up and some, something did come up. So he referred me to roles at Pinterest and at Bold. And the one at Bold started, you know, it's the one that worked out. Um, the reason I didn't get the one at Pinterest, I was like, let go almost immediately. And now you'll see how the difference is between this back then and this now, is they asked me if I knew what a software development life cycle was. At the time, I had no idea what that meant. Now, of course, I know. But our education back then was not nearly as good as it has now. Like I told Max at Local World this week, it's just gotten so much better. So I'm really happy for you guys. Like the quality of TLM graduates now is a million light years better than back then. <laughs> so um, at Bolt, there was no localization yet. They had started to do just British English. Um, Bolt was a consumer company, so B2C. And so I founded the program in terms of um, both strategy and operations. So roadmap, budget, deciding which languages to do next, um, localizing the product, marketing materials, customer support, chats, you know, all, all the different things that you need to localize. And um, I was there about four years. I also hired a MIS student at the time. He was class of 2014. Um, and at the time, I also um, was dabbling in product management. So long story short, um, the main product manager left at Bold and my boss said, Ava, you've been doing a great job of localization. How would you like to try your hand at product management? And I had two days to decide. I was like, oh, okay, um, let me think about it. And of course it was a good opportunity. So I said, yes. Um, and you know, it was a great experience. It was a very stressful time in my life because I was still head of localization and doing product management totally separately. It was like I was, you know, two jobs almost. And so um, it was a hard time, but I learned a lot and it was really good to see kind of the both sides, you know, product management from how the product is created and then also the end part, how it gets localized. Um, about four years later, I decided to take nine months off in before my next job, which I highly recommend if you have a really high stress job, don't be hesitant to take time off in between. <laughs> it's really good to save up some money and take some time to yourself uh, later in your career for sure. And then um, remember I said how Patrick, you know, got me this job at Bold. Well, guess who got me my next job? Still Patrick. So really still Patrick? Yes, he's my Patrick's job. Amazing. He's, uh, Patrick is amazing. Okay. I can't say enough about John Rich Surfer is also amazing. I've had so lucky to have amazing mentors in my life. So I let Patrick know, hey, look, I'm looking for a job again. He said, well, you know, this company called Stripe, they wrote to me, but I'm really happy at Eventbrite. I don't want to leave Eventbrite, but I told them my friend Ava, she's looking for a job. <laughs> so um, I ended up interviewing with Stripe um, and joined Stripe in March of 2018. And that was a much, much bigger challenge than Bold. Uh, it was B2B, which is a lot trickier a lot of times than B2C uh, in terms of success metrics and other things. And so I start there, I um, implemented a new TMS, um, got a new localization vendor, devised all the playbooks, all the different workflows for product localization, marketing localization, technical documentation, support site content, um, and many, many other things. And at the time, it scaled the team from just me to five people. And um, 
yeah, it was it, at that time I didn't do product management anymore, which I actually was glad about because localization there was definitely a full time job. <laughs> you couldn't do anything else. And um, in May, I ended up um, again deciding to take a break after four years, and I left. Um, took the summer off, so the summer I really recharged. My my brother came from Germany. We traveled, had a good time, and then um, I decided, you know, I'd love to work for myself if I can. So I started to build a consultancy, um, mostly honestly through a lot of other ex-Stripes, people that left Stripe, a lot of times they start their own startups or they join another startup. And they're like, oh, localization is harder than I thought. Um, oh, that Ava woman, yeah, I remember her, I'm gonna talk to her. So this has happened a few times, they reached out to me. So I have a few clients this way. Um, and then I did, I'm doing one other thing, which I'm really passionate about. I got a certificate as a professional coach because what I loved the most during my time at Stripe was actually coaching and mentoring some more junior employees and helping them figure out how to manage up, how to navigate corporate environments. Because these things are very specific to American culture and it's really tricky, I think, for those of us who come in from another country. So I really feel very passionate about coaching and mentoring women in tech. So that's my other, my other business that I'm building out. I'm sorry, that was a very long answer to your question. <laughs> no, that was... That was an epic journey. That was so amazing just to see that progression from, you know, as a student to now a professional in the field and you're mentoring other people now from, you know, being the mentee in the beginning. So that that was amazing to hear. And I love the story about, um, you know, you reaching out to Patrick. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was yeah. great. I was so lucky, you know, and that's why I really love mentoring and coaching because I feel I was given so much. I wanted to give back. And a lot of people say that, but I actually really mean that. It's just, it feels good. Um, they actually say like the, the, the true like feeling of happiness is actually um, giving to others, serving others. Mm -hmm. And it feels like you've had this entrepreneurial mindset kind of from the get-go from your parents. How important do you think that is in working in localization? You know, it really depends. I would say... Um, you could be perfectly fine not being an entrepreneur, being very happy inside the company you work for, making sure that you know you're you're doing right by your stakeholders. Um, and it just depends. I think it can help as you get more senior in your career to have a little bit of that entrepreneurial um, streak. Just because I think in any role, even in a company, people really appreciate. Um, employees that are like self-driven, that take initiative, that come up with new things. And sometimes having an entrepreneurial spirit can really help with that. Um, yes, you could go to work and just do what your boss says. We could do that for 30 years. Chances are you might not have as fast of a career, as good of a career if you do though. I think people that sort of drive things forward um, on their own and come up with their own ideas and implement them usually are the ones who have a better or steeper career trajectory. Mm -hmm. And you've yeah. lived that yourself. Yeah, yeah. I. <laughs> it's kind of funny. I just, it, it's not something I had to force myself to do. It just came natural. I just really like it. Um, and yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, it's really interesting. You know, I I did it kind of backwards, I would say, because I started having my own company and realized, nah, I'm not ready for that. <laughs> and then kind of started back at the bottom and then mm -hmm. sort of worked my way up. I, I, in all honesty, it's probably not super typical what I did. I kind of skipped um, a lot of steps, right? I went from being a project manager to being a head of localization. Typically, you would be a senior project manager, then a program manager, senior program yeah. manager. In my case, and this is a really interesting thing, uh, client side folks that are not in localization don't really understand the hierarchy that exists in localization, right? So if you interview at a startup and there's no one there that already does localization, they're not gonna say, hey, you're too junior. They're gonna evaluate you just on your knowledge. And if you sound like you can do the job, and I guess I sounded like I can do the job because <laughs> they hired me. And so it's just, you know, and it was on, it was a lot harder than it would have been if I had more experience working under other people for longer. Um, I had to figure out a lot of stuff on my own, but it's also you learn by doing, you know, it's just one of those things where you are just going to learn because you have to at that moment. And your learning curve is much steeper, but also the joy of kind of founding something and like getting to say, okay, this is best practices. This is how we're going to do it. That kind of compensated for any of the stress for me, you know, just being able to, to have folks who really cared about localization in the company and say, okay, if I like, how should we do this? You know? And so it was just, 
it was really exciting. Um, it's, it's not for everybody, but I would say if you want to skip a lot of steps in your career, it's not going to happen at a company like Apple or Google or any corporation because they have established levels and ladders for a localization career. A lot of times you can get ahead in your career by going to a startup because it's less, less focused on hierarchy in a startup. It's more about, hey, do you have the skills? Can you do the job? And then it's really about, you know, you doing that job rather than your title and so on. That's great insight. Um, you talked about how you founded the localization programs at both Bold and Stripe. So we all know that localization is not its own siloed you know, department. It has to work with pretty much all the other functions, like you said. So how did you kind of get the stakeholders, the marketing stakeholders, the product? How did you get them on board with you know, your localization program? Yeah, no, it's a great question. Um, I was hired into the product org at Bold at the time. So a lot of times localization will sit under product, um, sometimes under marketing, could be under growth, could be under operations. There's a few different places. The nice thing is being under product is that it was a, a revenue-driven org, right? Not a cost center. So in terms of getting others on board, it wasn't always easy. <laughs> I'll be honest. It's a lot of different folks. I remember... Um, Gosh, I remember for our customer service chat, you know, like, okay, yeah, we could translate all the different can't responses in a spreadsheet, but let's actually test it. Like you log in, you pretend to be the client. I log in, I pretend to be the, um, the agent. And so, you know, stuff like that, it was hard to get people to understand the importance of it. Um, but I think what always helps is honestly a launch date. If you have a launch date for a new country, you have to have the marketing emails ready to go. The website has to be ready to go. The product has to be ready to go. Um, and I think when people sort of understand the, the business mandate, like you have to do this for a launch, then that helps. The other thing that really helps is making a launch plan. So a launch plan could be you know, made by someone on localization saying, hey, for a user in that country to have a totally native feeling experience, like they do not think it's translated. They think, hey, this product, this experience was created for me in my country, in my language. You know, you need to do a number of steps to get there. Anything from translation to on-screen testing to user acceptance testing, regression testing, all these different things. And having that, this is where your program and project management skills really come in handy. Having a launch plan, communicating it super well, getting buy-in from other stakeholders saying, hey, for us to launch November 1st, well, all the marketing stuff we're doing needs to be ready October 1st so we can have proper time to test it and everything else. Um, so I would say in the big picture, everybody always understood why localization was important 100%. Yeah, we had to buy in on that. But now when it came to like getting stuff ready in time, that's a different story. People can commit to an idea without necessarily always falling through on all the execution. And that's where it was really important to to have interpersonal skills and really, you know, kind of remind people, but in a gentle way and asking how you can help them get there. And that's a super important skill for any localization professional because you so heavily work cross-functionally with every work in the organization. And so um, what were some like specific issues to product localization that, you know, you had to consider when you were expanding or uh, moving into different markets? <laughs> Yeah, um, gosh, there's a lot. And some of them are legal and regulatory. So for example, a lot of times when you sign up for a product, there's like a sign-in flow. You put a new email, you put a new password. A lot of times it tries to subscribe you to a newsletter. Um, in Canada, and don't quote me on this, I believe you have to have the option to opt in rather than opt out. So in the US, there's a check mark and you can remove the check mark to opt out. I believe in Canada, you have to have that link and you can choose to add the check mark. So there's little things like that where different countries have different regulations. So that's just like on the product feature side, right? In terms of other product localization things, I mean, some of the classic ITN things like, you know, truncation, text overrun, um, you know, encoding not working properly. Uh, so yes, everything was in Unicode as far as I know, but there are a few things that weren't that were really tricky for sure, um, at Bold. So it's one of those things where it's really different in every company and it's always something really unexpected when it happens, you know? It's like, oh, okay, I didn't think this was gonna go wrong. So it's just, it's 
you know, there's some basic things like don't put flags um, for languages, put the actual language, things like that. But um, a lot of it, honestly, besides localization, were just concepts, you know, for example, uh, so we did resumes and cover letters at Bolt. That was what we were selling. And in Germany, you have to sign your resume, um, you know, like you actually have to put a signature. That's not something you do in the U.S. So they had to change the product to accommodate for someone to maybe upload an e-signature. So that's just like one example, you know. And of course, like a CV, a curriculum vitae in Europe looks totally different than a resume in the U.S. Like you guys probably know this in the CV, it's kind of like chronological, like maybe even starting at kindergarten. A lot of times you put, if you're married, if you have children, your date of birth, if you have a driver's license, this stuff would be super illegal in the U.S. But a photo, in Germany you usually have a photo, also not illegal in the U.S. because it can lead to, you know, um, what's it called? Like um, like hiring discrimination. Yeah, like discrimination. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. So it's just, it's it was super interesting to see how different it was. Now for Stripe, it was like it totally, you know, for payment uh, products, it's a little bit different. There you have like differences in payment methods. Um, and then like the super basic stuff, like the date formats, you know, the date formats being different in every country, currency formats, um, the position of the currency symbol in the front or in the back, things like that. Um, so it's, it never is boring because there's always a different challenge in every kind of industry and every product. Thank you, Eva, for sharing. Yeah, and I'm sorry I was a little bit late. I'm on work. No yeah, but thank you for sharing. No um, but like you created so many teams, I think, during your experience, like how do you have something how you can measure the success of a fairly new localization team? Yeah, um, so so measuring success is really important because that's usually how you get budget and headcount. The word headcount, by the way, really confused me when I started in the corporate world. I was like, headcount, what does that mean? It's just how many people you can hire for that year or that, you know, half of the year, whatever. So to get resources, either money or people, you need to show that you're contributing positively to the business. And in terms of um, success metrics, the best thing you can really do is look at the company's overall success metrics and then try and slice it by language or by market. So let's say for a B2C product where it's much simpler, um, how many people sign up for the product? So registration. How many people buy the product? So, you know, they convert from a free user to a paying user. This is called conversion. And how long do they stay with the product? This is called retention. Um, and you can also measure things like the lifetime value. Like how much money do they spend over the lifetime of being a customer? Sure, they buy the first product. Maybe now they buy an add-on, now something else. So you try and be really close with the analytics team. Uh, most companies have the analytics um, business intelligence, BI team. And you say, okay, these are great metrics. How can we now um, run SQL queries, for example, that slice these by market or by language? And then you want to have visual representations. You want to have a, a success metrics dashboard, ideally, that shows, look, after we launched French, you know, uh, signups increased 100% in France and in Africa and in Canada, things like that. So you really, um, you know, want to borrow the success metrics for the company and then slice them uh, you know, by your own. And it's really important to kind of look at pre and post launch success metrics. So if you roll out, let's say French, you know, September 1st, what's the difference from August 1st to September 1st and then September 1st to October 1st? Um, success metrics can actually also be really helpful in finding bugs. So let's say, for example, you look how many people sign up and all of a sudden that just drops and you're like, oh, and then you, then you user test that and you're like, why is it only dropping for France or only for French? And then you're like, oh crap, some button isn't working. So those metrics can actually help you diagnose there might be an issue and help you look deeper into is something broken here? So success metrics can actually have many uses also. Um, so yeah, another thing you can do, and maybe you've heard about this, is called A-B testing. Are you guys familiar with this? Okay, yeah. So A-B testing rather than just rolling out a new language is actually better. So like 50% of users see French, the other French users see English. And then you can see exactly, oh, these people, you know, convert three or 5% better than these people. So really hard metrics like A-B testing is a really nice way to do that. Um, yeah. yeah. 
Thank you. <laughs> we just discussed it, I think, during one of our mm. courses with Ling when we did like testing mm -hmm. um, yeah. and put in a test in these things to estimate mm. also the success and the quality um, quality of the workflow. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Um, so how does your approach differ when um, you work with different teams like product or marketing or legal or help mm. center? Mm, I'm so glad you mentioned legal. I didn't mention legal earlier. <laughs> yeah, so um, you localize your approach, I guess is a good way to put it. You know, because people have different levels of understanding of what localization is. Um, so maybe one, one thing to do with all the teams, it's nice to create a short deck, like five to 10 minutes, and actually visit their team meetings. A lot of teams have like a monthly team meeting, sometimes even weekly. It depends on their cadence. And it's good to be make a guest appearance, uh, maybe once a year on that, maybe even more, saying, hey, we have a guest speaker today. And then you talk about why localization is and why it matters. So you're kind of laying the founding blocks for just those teams understanding what localization is. So that's maybe one of the first things to do. I really highly recommend it. Um, the second thing is um, I try to speak their language. So for legal, actually, in my former career, I was a paralegal. So I have a little bit of a legal background. So I really love talking to um, legal departments. And, you know, I try to speak their language. So for example, some of them may not understand why translation matters. In some countries, you actually are required to have it. Like you can't do business in Mexico, Brazil, Indonesia, or Thailand, I believe, without having like your terms of use in that language. So as soon as you're like, oh, it's a legal requirement to have the language, you're like, oh, okay. You know, so it really, um, it helps to speak their language quite a bit and also um, make them feel comfortable. Ask them about what their, what, their, um, what their concerns are, like, you know, understanding it's an important investment. So with legal, that's a lot of times it's a requirement to have translation. With other teams, um, again, you try and speak success metrics. With, ma with marketing, it's really simple actually because they care about the user experience. They want to set up you know, the product to be sold basically. And so if, if a user feels like, hey, this, this product was created for me in my language, they're much more likely to buy it. If you look at a website, you know, if, you, if you think of yourself looking at a website and you can't read it, you're not gonna buy the product. You know, It needs to not just, and also if the language is poorly translated, you're not gonna have as much trust in the company. So with marketing, it's really important to emphasize the user experience um, and the trust that is built by having the language, the native language of the user. With products, um, it's kind of the same thing. It's, you know, the user experience needs to feel native. So that's really, really important. Um, but I would say in general, it's just super important to think about what is important. How do they talk? What's their language? So for product people, a lot of times it's technical stuff. It's success metrics things like that. Um, so it's just um, understanding how to talk to them about things they care about. Um, and a lot of times, instead of talking to them, it's for, important to first just listen and just ask. So what are your priorities? What's important to you? What do you think should be important to international users? And really try and process what's important to them. And then when you explain why localization matters, if they don't already totally get it and why we should do a project, Try and use their words a little bit, you know, try to remember kind of what they said, tie it back into their priorities. Say, well, you know, this could help you with your revenue goals, with your revenue targets for the year, things like that. Um, and, you know, and then when you talk to people in operations, so like support, a lot of times that's much more kind of hands-on practical. They want to know the workflow. Um, why does this matter? They're really um, customer service focused. So how can we get, get a good customer experience? So always think about what does that person care about and how can I tie this back in with localization and how can I enable them to do their job better and to look good in front of their boss and to meet their revenue targets. Um, does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, this certainly makes sense. It's really, well, it's just like so cool to listen how the approaches differs, like differs to from team to team because everyone, literally almost everyone needs a special approach. And it's really a very interesting insight to know how to do that. And um, we also, uh, we have one question related to product management and project management. Yeah. 
Um, we understand the difference in general terms, but there is like a little bit confusion in uh, terms of localization um, and like the positions in localization, because, um, you know, some people just probably would think that the difference in localization between product management and project management is only in titles. So this is how this question actually occurs. And from your own experience, how do you differentiate the roles of product manager, like localization product manager and, pro mm. and the localization project manager? And yeah. uh, which position do you personally like more? Mm. So my experience, if you see a job ad that says localization product manager, it's someone not understanding what localization is. So it's it's literally, it's always in my mind, it's always project and program management. The only time that's not true is if you're working on an actual localization product. Let's say you work for a TMS company for a platform provider, and you're actually working on making the TMS better. Yeah, you're probably, you could say you're a localization product manager, but those are not the people that write those <laughs> job ads that say the product manager. It's just that a, most companies don't care. They just want the work done. And B, they've, you know, maybe they're in the product org, so they're used to using that word. But I, it, it's not, you know, they, we don't do product management because in product management, you talk to users, you know, you think about how you work with engineers to make a product. And that's not what we do in that way. We do in the sense that we often contribute to giving them an understanding of the international user experience. But, you know, we're not a product manager in the classical way. Um, there might be some people who disagree with me, but this is what I've seen in the industry. It's like whenever I've seen product manager, it's people who just like, yeah, let's just get this job description out and let's hire someone. They don't actually know. Just as you know, the tricky thing in our industry, a lot of companies still don't fully understand localization. Um, just in the same vein, they don't completely understand what someone in localization does and that it's actually project management. In fact, at Bold, they asked me, what do you want your title to be? Was product or project? And I said, eh, let's just say localization management. <laughs> it's good. <laughs> you know, it's just, um, yeah, it's just a confusion on their part for the most part. Um, and the jobs are quite different. In fact, when I was a product manager at Bold, I was a product manager, ironically, for the domestic product. I didn't manage the international product at all. <laughs> it was just for the domestic product. Someone else was doing international. So, they're very different. Yeah. yeah. And this is Ji Hong. And thank you for um, answering the, yeah. this uh, amazing questions. And and the, uh, there's a question from me. And from you have been doing a lot of roles in your career from project manager, vendor manager, from localization manager to consultant. Wow, that's really a great journey. And for us, uh, we are super in, uh, interested in how you start your career after you graduate from MIS. Mm -hmm. And could you give us a piece of advice on which job uh, should we uh, take as a starting point and how uh, facing all of those choices and opportunities come, coming out? Mm. Yes, I think we talked a little bit in the beginning, but let me recap very briefly. So I started having my own company. I don't recommend that usually. So. <laughs> You know, and then um, became a project. Well, let me take that back. So my internship was with language automation. So I was a project manager and a vendor manager, you know, at that time. Then I um, started my own company and then became a project manager at Apple and then became head of localization at Bold and then at Stripe. So it's not a very typical career path. What I would say, so there's, you know, the classic advice that people are given, which, you know, I may or may not agree with, but there's something to it. It's to work a few years on the vendor side to understand all the different client problems that come up and then go client side because honestly, it's less stressful and pays better. So uh, true story, right? I will caveat that. So you will learn more if you go vendor side first because once you're client side, you will only deal with one client's problems. You will not see as much of a variety of problems that you have to solve. So it can be really good for you to learn on the vendor side. However, it's really tricky to go from vendor to client side. A lot of times, um, client side people won't hire people with only vendor side experience, unfortunately. Um, of course, it does happen. Plenty of people switch, but it is harder. So a lot of times people go straight client side if they can, because it's better pay right away. It's less stressful. Um, and then you don't have to worry about switching later. Now, I'm not dissing the vendor side. Lots of people are happy working vendor side their whole life. 
for me personally, you know, that was not what I liked because I also really enjoyed learning about other fields. Like I love being able to have coffee with a marketing person or learning what SEM was or SEO was. I used to sit next to the SEO team and the SEM team. It's like, oh, what's that? Tell me more. You know, optimization. I get really excited learning about different things. So for me, client side was exciting because I got to kind of expand my horizons quite a bit. Um, but for other people, they really like, like John Ritzdorf is a great example. He was vendor side his entire career until a year ago and he swore he would never go client side. <laughs> he finally did. He can tell you why, but regardless, it's something that some people really prefer the vendor side. So um, in terms of advice for you starting your career, I would ask yourself what's important to you. Would you like, would you like to learn about a lot of different client problems and really become an expert in solving many problems and bring that knowledge with you and either stay vendor side or then bring that client side? Or do you want to go client side right away if you can and you know um, potentially have a little less stress and a little bit more money? So it's a personal decision. I don't think you can really go wrong. When I graduated in 2010, it was right after a recession. So we weren't very picky. <laughs> we took the job we could get. I don't know how it is now. We might be heading into another recession. It sounds like economy is not great. Yeah. So I would tell you, a job is better than no job. You can always switch later. <laughs> um, one thing I can really say, though, that um, I found that really works, and not just for local vision, any industry, an internship. So let's say you really want to work somewhere. You're like, this is my dream company. I always wanted to work. I don't know. What's what's a company you really like, Ji Hong? Like, where would you like to work in the client side? Like, for now, I would like to work from start from vendor side to okay. learn more. Yeah, and then I would like I would want, want to try uh, okay. to uh, better uh, the different positions and roles in client side. Maybe okay. in the next few years. Yeah, got you. Is there a company that you really love that you admire? Um, uh, nope. <laughs> not for now <laughs> okay sorry i'm putting you on the spot i mean to so okay so i don't know ling, ling or nor do you have any for me before? um it's paypal okay oh at the time being yeah got you okay so for example she really likes paypal right so let's say there's no job openings but it's like i really want to work at paypal like this is what i want to do i would try to um get an internship hopefully paid internship if needed, if you have some savings unpaid, because a lot of times if they really like you and you already are part of the team, it's going to be that much easier to become a full-time employee after being an intern. That's one thing. If, if nothing else works, that's one thing that works. Another thing I've really found is um, reaching out to people on LinkedIn, as my Patrick story told you. It can, don't be shy. That's the number one thing. Do not be shy. Ask for a virtual coffee chat. Tell people, you know, I really admire your knowledge. I want to learn more about your experience in your career. People will be flattered. Flattery gets you everywhere. <laughs> All kidding aside, you know, people generally want to help. You know, generally, if you write to people, we want to help, especially students, you know, our new grads, people really want to help. So I would really recommend networking, going to events, but also don't be shy to write people on LinkedIn and say, hey, would you be open to a virtual coffee chat? I'd love to learn more about your role. Um, and don't go, oh, can you help refer me to PayPal? I'm sure you wouldn't, but some people might. But you would just want them to understand, like talk about your experience and how passionate you are about PayPal. And that conversation will often come naturally. They'll say, oh, it sounds like you really care about PayPal. I'm going to definitely keep my eyes open in case a role comes along. And then sometimes that works out. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it does. But the more you do it, and the more the chances are it will work out. Yeah, exactly. That's a super helpful advice. Yeah, I never think about it, but I have to uh, think about it more. Uh, yeah, when I in the job. And when the final question is our brand local ready question. Um, our project name, as you know, is local ready, which means localization ready. Um, uh, so my question for you is, what makes a product local ready in your view? A product? Okay. Um. Well internationalization properly done <laughs> so um yeah if a product is local ready and this is what i tell all my clients and all the companies i work for you've done proper internationalization you've made sure that nothing is hard coded you make sure everything has unicode encoding um you know you let's see 
you've made sure that you've connected with all the right stakeholders and you have buy-in from them to be able to localize into all the languages you need and change the features also to match the market. So, you know, things like date and time format, but let's say, for example, even images. I'll give you an example from Stripe. We had a career website and there was somebody, a recruiter sitting on a couch and their foot was up on the couch. That was not a proper image for Japan and not for Germany, probably many other countries not either, right? And so that was part of localization. It's like, no, you're not ready to do this unless you need to pick a different image that is appropriate for the culture, right? So things like that. But um, personally, when I hear look ready, it's honestly, um, it's, it's proper internationalization. One thing I like to do sometimes, it's called a localizability report. You might have done this in school, I'm not sure, but um, where you look at the product in English and you mark all the issues that might appear. Oh, there's a video, well, it's an image. Okay, do we need to localize subtitles? Do we need to dub? So basically preparing yourself for localization um, in every way possible. Thank you. Sure. Um, that is all of our questions for today. I'm pretty sure we have like a gazillion others that just opened up um, thanks to your interview today. But um, that's all for today. Thank you so much, Ava, for coming on to Look Ready and sharing your insights. Mm -hmm.